Welcome to Pure Heart Church Online. So glad to have you here with us this weekend. If you're somebody that's new, thank you for joining us. We're so glad that you're tuning in. And if you're someone that's been hanging out for a while, thank you for continuing to watch and engage. If you are new, go to pureheart.org slash online connect, scroll on down. There's an online connect card button. We would love to get to know you. Is there something that you've been feeling that you're supposed to let go of? You think God's calling you into something else, but you're not quite sure what to do how to let go. There's some of those things that maybe you've been kind of holding on to. I'll tell you what, Pastor John today has a powerful message that's going to challenge you and encourage you as you evaluate how do you move from where you were into where God wants you to be. Welcome to church. Well, we want to welcome all of you. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend for our online campus. Special shout out to Crossroads Recovery. We love you guys, and we're so thankful to see what God is doing in your lives. Well, in 2018, I had the privilege of going to Israel. And in the old city of Jerusalem, we were able to go up to what is known as the Temple Mount. Perched at the center of the Temple Mount is a large structure called the Dome of the Rock. Now, why even bring this up? 
Well, the Dome of the Rock was built over the top of the place where it is believed that the defining moment in the life of Abraham happened. The Jews call it the Akedah or the binding of Isaac. It's really a famous story that is recorded in the book of Genesis, and it's one that's captured the imagination of Jews, Muslims, and Christians for over 4,000 years. Rembrandt, the great artist, painted arguably the most famous picture of the Akedah, which is rife with inaccuracies, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. But here's what I wanna do this weekend. I wanna read this story in its entirety. And I want you to let the narrative speak to you. Let it draw you into the tension and the drama in this story as it unfolds. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they both went of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now, as I listen to and or read this story, perhaps you're like me, questions just abound. And can we get some kind of an explanation as to why this is happening? 
I mean, here's a God that had given Abraham many covenant promises. How can God go back on his covenant promise? After all, Isaac was the promised child. Why would God condone murder, especially the human sacrifice of a child? What was Abraham thinking? What was going through his mind? I mean, we hear the narrative, we read the narrative, but we're not, we don't get third person omniscient here going into the thoughts of what Abraham is processing. And then here's my favorite question that comes out. Did Abraham ever tell his wife what was going on? I mean, my guess is a husband is probably not on the front end. Be like Sarah coming out and saying, hey, uh, Abraham, where, where are you and Isaac going? You got all this stuff. You got wood and fire. Oh, hey, Sarah, we're, we're just going camping, man. We're, we're, we're good. We'll, we'll be back in a few days. All joking aside, you know, our tendency as Christians is to look back on this story with, with an admiration of this man's willingness to do what was asked of him, and, and rightly so. But if that's our stance, if we're just admiring the faith of Abraham, I think we inadvertently distance ourselves from the human struggle that had to accompany this moment. It could not have been easy for Abraham. And ultimately, Abraham's life is going to be defined by what happens after God tells him what to do. You read the story of Abraham and it's very clear, up until now, he has done everything that God has asked him to do, everything, bar none. In fact, he is remembered among the writers of the New Testament as the prototype of faith. Let me give you just a few examples. Paul writes of Abraham in Romans chapter 4 and then also in Galatians chapter 3. And what we find is that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Here's a man who against all hope in hope believed and his faith grew stronger over time. There is no doubt that when you look at the entirety of Abraham's life, it was one that was measured out by the faith that, we had it, that he had in God. But here's what we need to understand. Faith and obedience are inseparable. The Jewish mindset, it wasn't enough just to believe. You had to carry out and live out what you said you believe. We could look at it this way. Faith is something that trusts obediently in the things that we can't control. Faith also lives obediently in relationship to the one that we can't see. And faith will venture obediently into places that we know nothing about. Faith is not a a, a disposition that sits quietly in our inner person, but rather it's an obedient life. It's an engagement of our will with the will of God that will take us somewhere. And somewhere along the way, just as Abraham did The challenge to us is for us to realize that once we say yes to God, the truth is we are not in charge of our own lives. Eugene Peterson put it like this. He said, the life of faith does not impose our will either on other persons or on the material world around us. Instead of making the world around us or the people around us or our own selves into the image of what we think is good, we enter the lifelong process of no longer arranging the world and the people on our terms. Wow, that's such an incredible challenge. Because we like control. We like to control outcomes. We like to control situations. But true faith in God is one that trusts, it's one that lives, and it's one that's willing to venture out into unknown places just simply out of obedience. So up until now, where we left off with Abraham's life in Genesis chapter 22, Abraham's faith had produced a quality of life. So now he's asked to do what many of us would look at as being the unthinkable, to offer up his son as a sacrifice. And if I'm Abraham, this is kind of what I'm thinking. God, you know what? You told me decades ago to leave my homeland. You told me to go someplace that you were going to show me, and I did exactly that. I didn't know where we were going but I followed you and I trusted you. We made covenants together. We fought battles together. God, we overcame hardships and mistakes. And God, I've lived obediently for decades. And now this? 
You gave me the the son of promise when my wife was was barren and she could not conceive and then Isaac was born and and, and now you want me to do what? I mean, if I'm being honest with you guys this weekend. If I'm Abraham and I've lived this kind of life, I've lived a life of faith and obedience and now this directive comes down from on high, my response to God is, you have to be kidding me. But there's something in this moment, ladies and gentlemen, that we cannot ignore. Twice in Abraham's life, God issues the command for Abraham to go and do something. In Genesis 12, verse 1, we read, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And the Hebrew language, the language of the Old Testament, that phrase, go from, is lek leka. And it's mentioned again, that same phrase, in Genesis chapter 22, the story that we just read, where he said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So in Genesis 12, and in Genesis 22, we have these bookend moments in Abraham's life. Go to and go from are the same phrase in the original language. And these bookend moments deal with something that I want to talk about with the rest of our time together. And that is with cutting the ties that bind us in this life. In Genesis chapter 12, Abraham is asked by God to cut the ties that bind him to his past to leave his family, his home, his country, and everything that he was tied to and follow a God who calls. And Abraham did just that. He cut the ties to his past and he staked everything on God's word. Now, let's be honest. It's difficult to leave everything, to cut loose from all those ties that brought us into the world and things that give us our identity, our safety, and our community. I remember many, many years ago when my wife and I had just gotten married. We'd been married just for a few months, and we had already found out five months into our marriage that we were pregnant with our, with our first son, which we totally didn't expect, but it was a blessing from God. And then I got a phone call from a church in Taft, California, inviting us to go and serve in that church as the associate pastors and as the, as the worship leaders. And, and I was 23 years old at the time that this phone call came in, almost 24. But I knew that God was doing something, and I had spent my entire life in one church. I had spent my entire life in the city of Phoenix, born and raised in, the, in, the, in this great city, And now God was calling me, and my wife had never been away from her family. God was calling myself and my wife to go just at his word, to leave the comfort and the security of the things that were tying us, our family, our safety net, and go from a large city into a small town that, if I'm being real with you guys, it was kind of like Mayberry. It was a small country-type town, and it was an adjustment. But I look back on those years that we spent there in Taft and I realize how much God blessed us. And by calling us to leave what we were comfortable with, God was setting us up for even greater blessings. And some of my fondest memories of my life in serving God came out of those years that we spent in Taft. My point being this, if we are to follow God, we must be willing to cut the ties that bind, the things in our past that might be holding us from the things that God wants to do in our future. Now we get to Genesis 22, and nearly 100 years later, think about that, nearly 100 years later, there's another cut that's got to be made in Abraham's life. So in Genesis 12, Abraham's got to cut ties with his past, but here in Genesis 22, think about this, he's got to cut the ties that bind him to his future. Isaac was his future. It was in Isaac that his name was going to be called, that his his seed was going to be called, that his lineage was going to be established. Now, I want to revisit this. I think it's super important to set us all at ease today. God does not command Abraham 
to sacrifice Isaac. Now, time and space does not permit me to go into great detail on this, but here's what I'll tell you. The way that the Hebrew language is constructed here, it effectively converts this to a request, not a command. In fact, most Hebrew scholars believe that when God speaks to Abraham, it should have been translated, please take your son and go into the land of Moria. See what is happening here. Abraham is free to refuse without any sense of moral guilt. The cut that God is asking Abraham to make, the tie that binds, is completely voluntary. It's simply a test of Abraham's faith. It's not a commandment to sacrifice his son. But nevertheless, it's a confrontation with everything that Abraham hopes for for the future. You see, God cut Abraham loose from the past a long time ago, and Abraham now has to learn how to trust God without the security blanket of his past. And a hundred years later, God's asking him to do the exact same thing with his future. See, it may be easy for us to say, okay, I'm ready to cut ties with my past, but I don't know if I can put my future in the hands of God. I don't know if I can cut away the security blanket. I don't know if I can take the, the, the son, so to speak, that I believe is going to guarantee my destiny and trust only in God. Four years ago, I was faced with another bookend moment in my own life. I had pastored the same church for 16 years, and God had established us there. We were comfortable We were in a place in our life, and I had even said publicly to our congregation that we were serving, I want to retire here. I want this to be my last stop. And then in July of 2018, God began to stir the heart of my wife and I that our season at Fountain was coming to an end. And I got to a point, ladies and gentlemen, where I had a conversation with God, and I said, God, I don't know if I can do this. I'm comfortable. I, I've got a great thing here. I've got a great congregation that God has asked me to serve. And now you're asking me to venture out into, into another place of the unknown. You're asking me to cut ties with my future. I mean, I've got my future right here, God. I've got it in the palm of my hands. I, I, I've got everything under control. And God said, just like you trusted me, In 1992, when I told you to go to Taft and you had to cut ties with your past and your comfort and your security at that point in your life, God said, I'm asking you to do the same thing. And when we said yes to God, it wasn't but just a short time later that my phone rang and it was Pastor Dan Steffen. And he said, John, he said, I think I got a spot for you to land here with us at Pure Heart. And I'm not going to lie, ladies and gentlemen, it was not an easy transition to once again say yes to God, once again say yes to to cutting the ties of something that I was so comfortable with. But I'm telling you, these last four years have been some of the best years of my life because I chose to cut ties with my future and put my future in God's hands. Now, what does this have to do with us who follow the way of Christ? It has everything to do with it. Jesus was having a conversation with his followers in Luke chapter 9, and he challenged them. Look at what he said in Luke 9, verses 23 and 24. Jesus said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. As you're listening to this message this weekend, I imagine that God is already challenging you in some areas. Maybe for some of you, God is calling you right now to cut ties with your past to cut ties with things that are holding you back, things that that are keeping you from getting from where you are to where God wants you to be. See, there's a, a plan and a purpose that God's got for your life, things that he wants to do inside of you. And there's a season that God wants to take you into, but it's hard for us to get into the next season if we are still tied to and anchored in the old season of our life. Maybe there's some relationships that are holding you back and it's, it's time to cut ties with those relationships. 
Maybe there's habits and lifestyles that that continue to hold you back from fully following the way of Jesus and embracing his best for your life. Can I just encourage you today that when you take that step of faith and you say, you know what, I am no longer going to let my past hold me back from what God's future is for me. I'm no longer going to do that. You are positioning yourself for God to fulfill his purpose and his plan in your life. So let me encourage you today. You want to get where God wants you? Be willing to cut the ties from the past. See, here's what I know. As I look at Abraham's life and his first calling in Genesis chapter 12 that we looked at, Abraham's God-ordained destiny was not in Ur where he was born and raised. It was in the land of Canaan. It was in a place of destiny that Abraham had never even seen before, but it was a place where God was going to abundantly bless him. And in order for him to reap the promise, he had to be willing to cut the ties. Now, on the other side of this, for some of you, God is calling you to cut ties with your future. Many of us walk the way of Jesus for years, even for decades, and then we get to a point in life where, you know, once again, God is asking something of us. God's asking us again to trust him. We may even be in a place of security, but God this time is asking us to take our hopes and our dreams and our comfort and our security and bind it up and lay it before him. Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, our security is not our source of provision. God alone is our source of provision. And I have just enough faith in my God that there will be a ram in the thicket if I am willing to cut ties with my future. Well, the writer of Hebrews gives us additional insight into this moment in Abraham's life. In Hebrews chapter 11, we read, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. I love that. Abraham had so much faith and so much confidence in God. So much trust in the God who had never let him down through his entire life. The ties that he had cut when he was in Ur of the Chaldees had come to fruition. Isaac was born. He was the son of promise. And now God says, I want you to trust me with your future. Abraham said unequivocally, yes. And if he had had to have gone through with the unthinkable, Abraham had enough confidence in his God that God was able to raise him from the dead. So here's our big takeaway for this weekend, ladies and gentlemen, when I am willing to cut ties with my past, God gives me a future. When I am willing to cut ties with my future, God gives my future back to me. God is asking, and I just simply have to say yes. Before we wrap this message up, there's another important element to this story that I have to go back to because lost in the mix sometimes of this story is Isaac. And as I mentioned at the top of this message, the Jews look at this story as the Ekedah or the binding of Isaac. Let me revisit this one verse from Genesis chapter 22. It says, when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. I mentioned at the beginning of the message that Rembrandt's famous painting that is coming back up on your screen right now, Rembrandt's famous painting had some inaccuracies in it, aside from the fact that Abraham and Isaac are very, very white and not Middle Eastern. According to Jewish tradition, Isaac was probably of marrying age, probably in his mid-30s when this event took place. So he was not a young boy. And let's just say that he was 36 years old. At the age of 36, he could have easily overpowered his 136-year-old father. It It would have been no contest physically. 
But here's what happened, ladies and gentlemen. Isaac consented to be bound. Don't miss that. He consented to be bound. In a beautiful picture of a son willingly submitting to his father, here's what we see. We see the way of Christ exemplified in the life of Isaac. You see, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, willingly chose to go the way of the cross. He went the way of his father, even though there was such anguish in him. When he cried out in the garden of Gethsemane the night that he was betrayed, he said, God, if there's any way possible, can you let this cup pass from me? But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus bound himself to the way of the Father. He bound himself to the cross in order to free us from sin and death. But there's more here than just this great foretelling of God's ultimate gift. You see, the word for bound is akot, which means wrapping in order to secure. There's a Jewish rabbinical scholar named Rashi who says that this word of being bound refers to the ring-like marks that are left behind as an indication of the binding. In other words, even after the ropes have been removed, the signs of the akkad still remain. The forensic evidence of submission leaves its impression. In the New Testament on resurrection morning when the disciples had discovered that Jesus had risen from the dead. There was one disciple, his name was Thomas, who said, you know what, unless I see the nail prints, unless I see the marks, I'm not going to believe. And eight days later, his disciples were all together. Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and he said to them, peace be with you. And then he looked at Thomas, who said, unless I see it, I won't believe it. He looks at Thomas, shows him his hands, and he said, Thomas, put your finger here. And then, remember the spear that was in my side, Thomas? He said, put your hand here and place it in my side. The marks are still there. Don't disbelieve, but believe. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus retained the marks of his submission to the Father in his resurrected body. Why? Well, if the resurrected body is the perfectly redeemed expression of the true nature of the human being, why why weren't, weren't those terrible reminders of the agony of the cross removed? Why wasn't the body of the resurrected Messiah perfectly new? The answer, of course, is that these marks of Akkad are the eternal badges of Christ's fulfilled mission. And when you and I see Jesus, whether we pass from this life or we're we're taken to heaven to be with him at his second coming, whenever that time comes and we see Jesus, you know what? You and I are going to see his marks of submission. They're reminders to us that in order for us to be free, Jesus had to be bound. Let me ask you this weekend, what are the marks of, that you bear in your life that show that you've submitted your life to God. What, let, let's think of it this way. What are the ties that are binding you right now that need to be cut? Because when we cut a tie in our life, whether we're cutting ties with our past, God is simply asking us then to bind ourselves to him and submit our future to him. Or maybe we've walked with God and God said, you know what, I'm asking more of you at this stage in your life. Will you once again cut ties with your future and bind yourself to me so that my purpose can be fulfilled inside of your life? You see, when we're willing to cut ties with our past, God gives us a future. And when we're willing to cut ties with our future, God gives a future back to us. Some of you may be thinking, you know, John, you don't know my past. It's painful. There's hurts, and I I can't shake the feelings of it. You know, the Apostle Paul writes to the Philippians, and he said, I forget those things that are behind me, and I reach to those things that are ahead of me. Well, you know, that's easier said than done. 
And it's not really a matter of forgetting. We know that it's really impossible for us to forget. Only God has that capability. But when we talk about forgetting the past, we are saying we are no longer allowing our past to control us. We cut that tie. You know why? Because we realize God wants to do something greater inside of us. He's got a hope and a future and a purpose for us. And all he's asking of us is to say no to the past and say yes to his future. Or you might be listening, watching this message this weekend and you followed Jesus for years and now God's asking something new of you and it's making you a little bit uncomfortable because God's asking you to cut the ties with your future. And as you cut those ties, what you're doing is you're once again binding yourself to the purpose of God and allowing him to give you back a future that's filled with his blessing. You see, binding ourselves to God's will is not just for binding's sake, but it's rather so that we can see the purpose of God fulfilled in our life. Abraham's future, it was secure because he was willing to go and he was willing to bind himself to whatever God was asking of him. What's God asking of you? Is he asking you to cut ties with your past? Is he asking you to cut ties with your future? Either way, the ask for us is that we now bind ourselves to whatever it is that God wants to do inside of our lives. Bless you guys this weekend. We love you. What a powerful message by Pastor John. You know, as we move into a moment of reflection, just stay with me and, and process with me. What are some of the areas in your life where you have to let go? You got to trust God in this process. You've been struggling with that. You know, I remember years ago, I had a great career in the construction industry. I was doing building inspections and estimating. And then I felt called to go into faith-based video ministry. It was very surreal because I go, why would I do that? I don't know anything about that. I was about 32 at the time, I had just been married, and I had no experience in it. And I go, is this really what God's calling me into? And it took me about a year of struggling and processing and going, okay, God, you know what? If, I, if this is what I'm supposed to do, you're going to have to help me figure it out. But I don't know what this is going to look like. But you do. That's been an amazing journey since. I'm really honored that here I get to stand every single week and I'm humbled that I get to come and be alongside thousands of people in their walk with Christ. Like, how, how did I get to a spot like this where I get to love and encourage people as part of what I do? What a blessing. But see, God knew what I didn't know. Now, as you heard the message today, maybe you've never accepted Christ, but today you realize that there's some old stuff that you kind of need to leave behind. You kind of need to reset, start over, way to move forward into a new chapter of your life. See, I want to pray with both sets of people today. Those of you that maybe you've never accepted Christ, but realize you need to move ahead. And those of you who have accepted Christ, but you need to leave some of that stuff behind also. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this message. We thank you for John's passion and sharing. We thank you for his personal experience that he shared of how it was a struggle to leave those things behind, Lord. And so let each one of us in those areas you've brought to our mind and to our heart, let us leave them behind so that we can move forward into what you've called us to, God. The good things you have for us, the things that we can't see, that we don't know yet, but you say you've got good plans for us. And Lord, if there's someone today that they haven't accepted you into their life, we just ask that they pray along with me. Heavenly Father, I recognize that my way in the past was wrong. I leave that behind. I accept your forgiveness of my sins into my life. I desire a new life with you to move forward. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, we'd love to connect with you. Make sure you hit that online connect card so we can just walk with you because no one should walk alone. Now today, I wanted to highlight something a little bit different than our usual for the sake of others moment. We just don't want to make things about just pure heart. We don't want to just rah, rah, pure heart. See, God's blessed and empowered churches all over the world to carry out his work. And 
That's why we pray for other churches and other pastors. And we do that during our live church services. A couple years ago, we built this studio, Creative Studios. And we did it to create high quality video and audio content, ways to engage with people online in deeper ways, people that are joining our congregation, uh, in deeper ways with the message of Christ. And it's where we write and record songs. We film many of the sermons and online campus content you see, that's where I'm standing right now. And during worship today, you even saw the audio and video production rooms as we were moving from one room to the next. But part of the vision for our studio was not just for Pure Heart, it's to make it available to other churches and ministries, ones that might not have the financial capabilities to do something like this. And so you may notice I have kind of a unique shirt on. This shirt is from Burundi, Africa. And that's where an amazing congregation called Iglesia Vivant is from. Living Church is what that translates to. This church not only ministers to an underserved local community, but it also oversees 350 congregations in four African countries. It has affiliates all over the world. And then they have a compassionate nonprofit uh, arm called African Revival. This runs medical clinics, orphanages, aid centers, does agriculture assistance, advocacy for tribal communities. And then their food program in schools feeds kids, 6,000 of them every day. So they can actually have enough food to think and process at their school, fill their hungry stomach. Founding pastors Edmund and Faith Kuvi are here in Phoenix, and they want to do a high-quality video devotional to the congregation. And this is because last week their church was celebrating 30 years since its founding. We brought them into our studio, we captured and sent it to the church, we did a little some light editing, and this encouraging message by this amazing couple went on out during their 30th anniversary. It was shown to their congregation and then posted on Facebook, where in the first five days, check this out, it received over 13,000 views. See, we're blessed to be a blessing. We're blessed to have this studio. We, we are grateful for it, but we can't just keep things to ourselves. Each of us in our lives, God calls us to bless others. What a beautiful joy for us to be able to love these Christ followers that lived on the other side of the world. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we pray right now for the living church, God, as it translates to. We thank you that you're ministering to this congregation. You're doing great things in their lives, God. That 30 years you're continuing to build and build, God. That they are touching and reaching people all around their uh, Africa, God, not just in their local community, God. We pray that you're going to bless their pastors, bless each of the pastors of these congregations all over Africa, Lord. We pray that right now you, God, are going to continue to direct them in the way that you want for them to go, God. And if there's things that they're supposed to leave behind, you're going to let them know that also, Lord. We pray a blessing upon their congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you, Pure Art family. We're so glad that you joined us today, and we'll see you next week. Thank you so much for watching all the way through. We pray that this leaves you encouraged and ready to enter into another amazing week. Don't forget to connect with us via our online connect card found on our website, pureheart.org, where you can give as well to the mission and vision of Pure Heart. Remember, it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to pretend and it's not okay to stay stuck. We'll see you guys next weekend.